everyone. Today's program is the fifth day of print month, and it is a collaboration between the IFPDA and the Metropolitan Museum with the IFPDA member, Gemini G-E-L, the print publisher. Let me say at the outset that there are some 400 of you registered uh, today. Uh, you may ask questions by hovering your cursor over the Q&A icon at the bottom. Uh, that will text them in, and we will try to get back to everyone um, in the next few days. The program is very packed, and we won't be able to do it while we are live today. I'm David Tunick, president of the IFPDA, the International Fine Print Dealers Association, and I thank you for attending this very special virtual studio visit. It is my honor and privilege to introduce the leaders of both the Metropolitan Museum and Gemini GEL, Gemini's co-founder and president, the legendary Sidney Felsen. Uh, it's no secret that Sidney is a remarkable 97 years old, and we're so happy to have you with us today, Sidney. The impact that Sidney has had on the art world and printmaking cannot be overstated. In a real sense, he was there at the inception, the dusk of the abstract expressionists and the dawn of pop. He is the man who brought printmaking to the next generation of artists. Sidney co-founded Gemini GEL in 1965, an accountant by training and in practice and an art student by choice. You were introduced, Sidney, to art by a girlfriend, and you began to visit galleries on La Cienega Boulevard. Some of them sold prints by Chagall, Picasso, and Miro, but you were looking to the new future, beyond the old standards and beyond the abstract expressionists. At a Christmas party in LA, you met famously Ken Tyler, the great master printmaker, and before the evening was out, you were on the road to acquiring his printmaking workshop called Gemini. You added the GEL, which stands for Graphic Editions Limited. The first edition you printed was by Albers, whom Ken Tyler knew. Soon after that, in what seems today like a torrent, you brought in Rauschenberg, Lichtenstein, Stella, Oldenburg, Ellsworth, Kelly, and then Jasper Johns, and many, many others. It was astonishing. They loved working with you and you were pals with all of them. You called them, quote, my children. They were in their 20s and 30s. You were in your 40s. In fact, you've never let up. You still go to work every day uh, as you near your first century of life. And for that, we as your fellow members in the IFBDA and the public are all grateful both to you and your partners and team, which notably includes your wife and our member, Joni Weil. Um, a footnote for the audience, to learn more about Gemini and Sydney, uh, please note that the uh, Gemini archives are at the National Gallery in Washington, and two years ago the Getty acquired 70,000 photographs taken by Sydney that in effect document his life and relationships with the artists he's worked with as a publisher. Max Holine, we welcome you to your, what I believe is your first IFPDA event and we thank you for being here. Uh, Mr. Holine is the Marina Kellen French Director of the Metropolitan Museum, where he was appointed in 2018. Prior to the Met, Mr. Holine had served at the Guggenheim here in New York as Chief of Staff to the Director, then for 15 years as Director at the Städel in Frankfurt, Germany, before taking over as Director of the Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco. He has published widely and mounted many exhibitions on the world stage in his specialty, modern and contemporary art. A native of Vienna, Mr. Holine has an advanced degree in art history and an MBA, both from the University of Vienna and is the recipient of a host of international awards, prizes, medals, and titles. The Met job is of course huge and so is its collection of more than 2 million objects spanning thousands of years. The crowds are also huge, some six and a half million a year. There is no museum in the world that is more in the public eye than the Met, 
and also, of course, that public eye is on its director unfailingly. We won't list your responsibilities, Max, at the museum, but to summarize, it is virtually everything. So as we begin to emerge from this scourge of a pandemic, which you have navigated so well and so wisely, we wish you continued greatest success at the Met, which carries on with the celebration of its 150th birthday. Full transparency, I personally have always felt a special connection to and affection for the Met because it was the Met that gave me the opportunity to work in its print department soon after I graduated from college. And with that, I turn the program over to the Metropolitan Museum of Arts director, Max Holine. Thank you so much, David, for the warm welcome. It's great to be here. It's great to be part of this event. And it's also, of course, an honor to be here together with Sydney. Um, and all of our collaborators. As you might know, the year 2020, so last year, marked a very special year in the history of the Metropolitan Museum. It's our 150th anniversary, or was our 150th anniversary. So of course we had different plans for that year, uh, and uh, we wanted to celebrate this special moment. Um, we just celebrated actually last weekend with a big Met Fest, uh, now almost like a year later. But uh, what we're talking about uh, today is the print portfolio that we, we, we are publishing and we published for the Met 150 year anniversary. It's obviously now coming uh, uh, to fruition uh, a year later, but it's maybe also part of that story. But I still can remember uh, when I started the Met and we started talking about it uh, together with Sydney and others. Um, and we kind of thought, OK, this is the moment for us to now move forward with the print portfolio. Little did we know what would happen in between. So in 2018, uh, the Met commissioned uh, 12 artists with from very, very different areas, diverse backgrounds, of course, interests and styles. But all of them have deep ties with the Met. So we commissioned them to, do, to create an original print that celebrates the museum's 150th anniversary and also reflects on the Met as a cultural institution. The Met published actually 50 years ago for the 100th anniversary, another print, uh, print together with uh, Bob Rauschenberg. So it's basically kind of a, a continuation of that, of course, in long, long time gaps. Um, and I have to say, it's really also a very generous uh, gesture by the artists who have participated and who are supporting the Met through this print portfolio. And uh, it's been a real pleasure to work uh, together with them. Much has changed, obviously, since the Met uh, and we all have originally conceived this print portfolio. And so in a certain sense, the portfolio itself has taken on additional meaning. It was done, indeed, exactly during the pandemic, during a global uh, pandemic that kind of affected everyone, everyone who participated in it, all the artists who worked on it. It made the work for sure also more challenging, the exchanges more, more challenging. But on the other hand, uh, a lot of the, the artists were, were basically in their area, in their, uh, their, their home base, and kind of it, it created a different, uh, I would say, also a uh, working process. And it also shows, to a certain extent, also the resilience of the project and uh, the commitment by everyone to getting it done. So it's my great pleasure now to give you a preview um, of, uh, of the print portfolio and of each of these prints. And you will see that each of them, of course, it's their own uh, artistic, has their own, uh, its own artistic language. It's kind of a composition of that portfolio. The, so all the 12 prints, they speak about, of course, the strength of um, basically a, a multi-vocal way of uh, addressing uh, current uh, important aspects of um, printmaking, of artistic practice, of voices that we want to and want to see and, and hear, and also um, uh, multiple perspectives on how we can understand the world and how we can make connections through art and through creative ex expression. So the first uh, print uh, that I want to show you is by Sia Majani, um, and I hope that uh, we can get the, the slide presentation up. So uh, Sia, um, who, who had a, a major show, uh, of course, at the Met Breuer, uh, did um, 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 a print that, of course, combines two of his central motifs, the bridge and the house. 
And this whole work kind of all, often revolves around concepts of movement history and the passage between spaces. Between, I mean, also the, the relationship of the body towards, towards the physical environment. I mean, he finished the RTP for this print just shortly before he passed away. So we're of course very sad about that, but in, in a sense, it's also, we are proud to have this work as a really manifestation also of his artistic practice in the portfolio. Um, the next uh, print is by Via Salmans. And of course, Via's practice, especially also in printmaking, embraces on the one hand, also formal and technical challenges. And you'll see this extraordinary wood engraving. Um, that focuses our attention on the details of what you see here. It's an ocean surface, as she's done. Uh, she did that uh, a lot of times. I mean, she did skies, she did ocean surfaces. And here kind of, of course, as is true for, for a lot of her other work, she kind of embraces these aspects that oscillate between ex abstraction and figuration uh, and retaining recognizable elements, but basically giving you a, com a completely new universe to basically almost like immerse yourself into. Um, and to a certain extent, uh, in a similar kind of spirit, but of course, very different uh, way of doing it, is Jasper Jones, who is a master printmaker, of course, as well. And he worked on this um, digitally for the last uh, year on this extraordinary print that shows three primary colored stick figures. And they're holding what could be interpreted as small brooms, but probably also like paint brushes underneath a starry night sky. And then against you have this ghostly index of pair of hands and a giant skull that looms over it. So it's kind of this, again, this multi-layered uh, practice that uh, Jasper Jones, of course, uh, always has. And it basically kind of gives a whole range of associations. We're very proud to have that, of course, have that print even be, now become public as coinciding, of course, also with his great retrospective at uh, Whitney and in Philadelphia. Uh, next print uh, that I want to share with you is by Carrie James Marshall. And um, again, another artist who uh, we, uh, the Met has a, uh, has a strong history with. And you have the, here, uh, Carrie James Marshall uses the surrealist game of uh, exquisite course or cadaver excre and in his print he creates this vibrant composition that's divided in these three distinct horizontal bands um, and each of them is done and that's really fascinating with three so different printmaking techniques so you have screen print wood cut and lino cut in six colors um, the next print uh, that i can share with you is by julie Mereto. Um, uh, who employs, an, of course, her, her signature abstract language uh, composed of multiple marks, sizes, densities, architectural references, structuring of the picture plane. And it's a layered uh, 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 process that basically then results into a, a work that has such extraordinary visual and symbolic power. Uh, again, another artist uh, with, who works with strong symbolic power, and that's Vangechi Mutu. Uh, and she created a lithograph and a sync screen print in five colors uh, with hand applied gold uh, pigment. Um, and basically, of course, it kind of encapsulates all the different subjects that she kind of addresses in her work globalization, gender, racism, also the legacy of colonialism. And so she kind of juxtaposes all these elements in, in a powerful and really striking image that you can see here. Um, then uh, Gabriel Orozco, um, he uses the medium of photography and minimalist constructions uh, to, to memorialize the ephemeral and capturing fleeting and unexpected moments. Uh, for those of you who know Gabriel Orozco's work, I mean, he works in, is really works in all different medias. And so kind of the, the print for him is basically also a way of kind of really, really kind of encapsulating uh, these elements that sometimes in his other work kind of, uh, kind of more from one media to the other. Um, someone who also kind of encapsulates a certain spirit in this very special way is Ed Roche, of course. And who engages, of course, with language in this dynamic uh, embossed lithograph in four colors, and really a signature work by Ed Roche that he's done uh, for the print portfolio. Um, and then Richard Serra um, and his composite for the Met, that's how it's titled. And it's this typical 
strong Richard Serra uh, print that we, uh, we know. It. These are deep, saturated black tones, rich sculptural texture. Uh, it's an excellent etching made uh, with oil stick. And as, as it's true for a lot of, of course, his work, it's remarkable in its, fit, in its physical presence as a print. And uh, challenges, of course, assumptions about printmaking and what, and what a print is and what a sculpture can do and, uh, and, and in that context as well. Um, and then uh, Wanjani Shetta, um, who is uh, with us uh, today and who will speak uh, momentarily. And I'm really, we are so excited and glad to have her here. Um, she translates effects of shadow and light and color and texture of, uh, of natural events in this folded woodcut and screen print in eight colors. I'm not going to talk more about that because we, we've got Ranjani here who will talk about that. We have a great, I mean, we of course have great works of Ranjani in our collection. She's also a sculptor and, and, and other works. So I'm really excited to have her here. Um, and then another work that I want to present to you is Sarah Z's Papillon. And it's an embossed screen print in 13 colors. And it, what's true, of course, with uh, Sarah's work, uh, both in regard to her uh, drawing, her, her printmaking, but of course, her uh, larger scale installation, they're always layered dynamic compositions filled with fields of color and media imagery, photo based elements. And basically, kind of, it seems to kind of almost like go beyond the limit of uh, the paper, but also. Um, it feels also very um, multi-layered, media-driven, complex in our visual perception. Um, and then finally, uh, the final print that I can share with you is by Xu Bing. Uh, and he, uh, of course, engages, um, surprisingly, if you look at it for, uh, at first sight, but he engages with the digital realm with this work. It's called Art for the People for the Met. And what you can see here is these the red stamps, which of course mimic uh, imperial uh, uh, sign, I mean stamps that I usually see on Chinese ink drawings, he employs these, them as QR codes. So located in these red seals are hidden messages that if you use your phone and you kind of scan that, you are being taken to the museum's website with additional messages and information. So these stamps are interspersed with a text rendered in square word calligraphy. It's a writing system that the artist invented in which letters from English words emulate Chinese characters. So that's kind of uh, what I can share you about the print portfolio. We'll hear more about this for sure. I just want to thank everyone who has been uh, participating uh, in this uh, whole endeavor and who made that possible. And that's especially uh, Sharon Copeland Hurwitz, who is our co-publisher and dynamic, uh, energy providing a really kind of motivator to get this project done. And also Jennifer Farrell, our great curator for drawings and prints here at the Met, who has been instrumental in doing this project and working together with, with the artists. And then of course, uh, Gemini, uh, GL, the workshop. Um, I mean, it's been an honor to work with Gemini and uh, to work together with Sydney and Joni Wildfelsen. Uh, we are, uh, it's been a Herculean project and it relied on the great experience of Sydney and the excellence, not only of printmaking, but also the, the great understanding that Gemini has in working together with artists. Without them, this project would not have been possible, especially during the pandemic. So we are deeply indebted for that. And I want to turn it now over to Sydney. Thank you so much. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm, just, I'm speaking on behalf of Sydney, uh, whose voice is faltering a little bit this morning. But I have his remarks, and they are as follows. Gemini is in its 55th year. Throughout that period of time, and even way before then, I considered the Metropolitan to be one of the great museums and possibly the great museum of our country. When we were asked to print and produce these editions, it was with a sense of pride that we immediately said yes. In addition to the artists, our printers and curators were the true heroes in this collaboration. Hand printing is a demanding profession. It's a combination of almost eight hours of physical activity every day, plus the pressure of working directly with the artist during proofing sessions, coupled with the need for intelligent decisions. The selection of the artist was at the highest level. Congratulations to Max and his wonderful staff at the Met, 
and to Sharon Copeland Horowitz, who co-published this great accomplishment. Thank you, Max, and thank you, Sydney and Joni. Um, my name is uh, Jennifer Farrell. I'm a curator in the Department of Drawings and Prints at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and it's been my great honor to be involved in this project with all these incredible, incredible people. As uh, Sharon Copeland Horowitz, just a, a force of nature to really enable this, and to work with the legendary uh, Sydney Felsen. So. Um, I just wanted to show very quickly, this is the Met 150, which is now on view at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. I saw there was a, a question in the chat about that. So this is on view, I believe through um, December. So if people want to view it. Um, I just wanted to start with a little bit of context because you can see also, this is an installation shot from making the Met 1870 to 2020, which some of you may have seen. It had the great misfortune to be scheduled during the pandemic. Um, so it, the dates were a little bit off, but as you can see, this is Robert Rauschenberg's Centennial Certificate MMA, which is featured really as part of the museum's history. And we see the print portfolio, the Met 150, functioning in much the same, the same way. So I'm just going to provide a little background about um, this work. So as part of the festivities to commemorate the Met's 100th birthday, the museum worked with the artist, oops, sorry, don't know that. Uh, Okay, so the museum worked with uh, the artist Robert Rauschenberg to create a limited edition print to celebrate uh, the occasion. And Rauschenberg, given his interest in combining both found imagery and printmaking, uh, was a natural fit to create this commemorative print. Published in 1969, which was slightly in advance of the anniversary, um, Centennial Certificate MMA is a work that through imagery and text makes reference to museums founding, contemporary activities and future endeavors, as well as reflecting the artist's own uh, concerns and working processes. Henry Galzahler, then the curator of 20th century art said that the Centennial Certificate represented, quote, Bob's idea of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. The multiplicity of images and colors can be read as reflecting the experience of flipping through a guide to the museum or visiting the Met at the time the work was created. Indeed, Rauschenberg described the Met as being a kind of live encyclopedia. And to portray this idea, he created a collage of works drawn from across the Met's collection. He originally hoped that the Met would, curators would provide input as to the selection of art to be depicted. But upon discovering that that was not possible, he visited the museum and took photographs of the works that interested him. As many of the works uh, were not on view, he also used um, archival sources that he requested from the museum. So looking at the work, what you can see is an image of the museum's facade by Richard Morris Hunt on the upper right, paintings by Vermeer, Rembrandt, Campin, Veronese, Picasso, details of an Assyrian relief, a medieval manuscript, uh, unicorn tapestries, a bodhisattva, an Egyptian mummy, and a portable harp. I'm just showing you. Here's an image of Rauschenberg um, with one of the Mylers. Uh, some works were not included due to practical issues, such as how a reproduction of a particular piece would fit in the overall composition. And despite drawing from the collection of several departments, he notably, um, his selection notably omits works from the 20th century, aside from Picasso's uh, portrait of Gertrude Stein, as well as from Central and South America and Africa, areas from which the museum has had work since 1877, in which they would expand in 1969, the same year the print was begun with the establishment of the Department of the Arts of Oceania, Africa and the Americas, following a promised gift from Nelson Rockefeller. Rauschenberg described the process of creating the print as akin to, quote, designing a currency. It was printed from two stones and two aluminum plates in red, yellow, blue, and brown on handmade paper that was created in France specifically for this project. It was described by Tatiana Grossman, the founder of ULAE, 
and the publisher for the print as being, quote, a kind of medieval paper, which provided slight irregularities, such as the non-standardized dimensions. Um, archival documents had a great impact on Rauschenberg, who decided to pay homage to them by incorporating signatures of contemporary museum officials on the surface so as to mirror the original graph paper in which various figures signed a charter establishing the museum in 1870. So on October 20th, 1969, six museum officials, which included uh, the director, Thomas Hoving, John McKendry, the curator of prints, Henry Gelzoller, curator of contemporary art, each hand signed all 45 prints in the edition making it resemble a kind of cartouche and thus allowing the print to really function as a certificate or as Rauschenberg described it, a kind of currency. Rauschenberg signed the print twice, once in graphite under the image with the edition number and the date and the other time in the print itself in the image I'm showing you here, where written on the lithographic stone with his meditation on the museum appear his initials, RR at the end of a short passage inspired by the museum's 1870 charter in which the museum's founders stated the goals for the museum. Layered over an image of an Irish harp and a fragment from a Greek frieze is text Rauschenberg wrote, 100 years, treasury of the conscience of man, masterworks collected, protected, and celebrated commonly. Timeless in concept, the museum amasses to concretize a moment of pride, serving to defend the dreams and ideals apolitically of mankind, aware and responsive to the changes, needs, and complexities of current life while keeping history and love alive, RR. So with that, I will turn over the screen to uh, my colleague, Sharon Copeland Horowitz, who is the co-publisher of the Met 150. Thank you, Jennifer. So my name is Sharon Copeland Horowitz and I am the co-publisher of the Met 150. And it has been a privilege to work alongside of you, colleagues of the Met, all of the artists in Gemini on this really once in a lifetime experience. Um, Jennifer is gonna be pulling up, I think some slides um, of the artists, but we're gonna be looking at photos of several of the artists who've worked on their prints at Gemini for the Met. And as David mentioned, um, these photos were taken by Sydney Felsen, who not only is the incomparable um, a co-founder of Gemini, he is an accomplished artist um, who as uh, David said, uh, has an archive at the Getty. And he's lovingly documented all of the artists working at Gemini over the years in the workshop. And this includes many of the artists who were able to get to Gemini for the Met 150. Um, I think the photos are really telling. Um, of course, they talk about process. They talk about the collaborative spirit and nature of printmaking. But what I really think they hint to, and I think Max um, mentioned this, is the very special environment, nurturing one that Gemini provides, which is so supportive and welcoming to artists, which is why Gemini was the ideal partner for production and for printing for this portfolio. Um, the Met 150 was a very ambitious project that the museum set out to do. The scale of it, there were 12, international artists invited all throughout the globe with all different levels of engagement um, and knowledge of printmaking. Um, and they all had really demanding schedules. Um, we had a very tight timeline, which is uh, was the Mets birthday celebration, which Max mentioned. And then as he also mentioned, COVID hit, which really added another layer of complexity to the project. And it really is a testimony to Gemini, to the artists that we were able to get this done. Um, the four artists that you're gonna see here, um, here at Zubing, uh, but it's Kerry James Marshall, Sarah Z, um, Zubing, as I mentioned, and Ranjani Shatar, we're so excited to have today, have all made prints before, but what was kind of astounding and what these photos might not show is that they were very new to Gemini. They'd never worked with Gemini, but you can immediately sense from the photos 
that there's a sense of ease, um, a trust and ability really to hit the ground running and work, um, which is really magical and in the DNA and, and in the air when you're at Gemini. And, um, you know, you really have to think about these artists who, um, you know, really only had a few days to be at Gemini and they were able to communicate and execute with the master printers. Today, you're gonna to hear from Joel Lerner, um, their ideas. And then there were, as Max mentioned, so many dialogues and exchanges that have to happen after the fact via FedEx and back and forth, uh, when getting moved to, to Africa, artists back and forth. And, you know, it was just really incredible that this, pro this project got pushed further um, and to completion. And so Gemini, has just been an incredible friend to the Met and an incredible friend to me um, as, as the artists have become. So I'd like to introduce one of the artists who we're so grateful to have today. So Ranjini Shatar, who um, is a part of the Met 150. I just have to tell you, Ranjini, there was so much excitement. I remember talking to Gem Gemini in anticipation of your arrival from India. And I know that in your short time there, you forged such a wonderful working relationship with Jill Lerner. And I'm so excited to hear you in dialogue together now. And I just wanna thank you so much for your time and your devotion to this project and for making a work that everyone can see is not only beautiful, but that sings. So I'd like to turn over the screen to you now, Ranjani. Thank you, Sharon. Hi. Hi, Jen. Uh, okay, great, great song. Hi, Ranjani, how are you? Good to see you. I'm good, how are you? Good. Well, I, I, uh, I just want to let everybody know that uh, it was just a real pleasure to be able to work with all the artists, uh, whether by mail or the ones that traveled from India. And uh, there were 17 printers involved in this project and all four studios. But uh, today, <laughs> today, um, I just wanted to you know, start with Ranjani's piece. She came totally prepared uh, with a, a sketch regarding like, where important wood grain would be and what, what sort of color scheme she wanted. So right away, our first thing that, that we did was to uh, find a, a hardwoods shop. And uh, Ronsney, I think, you know, you pulled out, I don't know, maybe 20 planks of wood until you, you found something that, that worked for you. Right. <laughs> yeah, it, it uh... It was an interesting process. We uh, went hunting for wood. I wanted to use something that was that I wouldn't work with in my uh, in my home. Something that's available in America. So we got uh, different wood like Douglas fir, oak, and beech, and um, um, cedar. And right. uh, yeah, we um, looked at the grains. Um, uh, we blasted the wood. Um, Right, we, yeah, we did. We did. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and uh, yeah, and we've printed the grains. If you can see, um, Jill can show that. Right, I think you know. I remember what was one thing that was important to you was to find one piece that had some raw edge, you know, and that right. ended up being a, a pretty important part of the piece. Right. So once once these grains were found, um, you were able to you know, lay down a mylar and, and find the, find the shapes within the wood. And, right. <laughs> and I, yeah, here, um, yeah, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, and here are the pieces of wood, the, uh, the wood that, you know, we found and cut and, and uh, they have a little, uh, I think, history of, of how you inked them, you know, how, what the colors that you chose for the, for the print, but, um, yeah, so it was, I think, how long were you here? Were you here about four days? Yeah, for, for barely for five days, yeah. And, right. Uh, yeah, by the end of it, we got to uh, RTP. So um, right. it, it was incredible. I mean, you know, um, it was a long process, um, um, finding the right kind of word and finding the section of the piece that we really want to print and how they go with each other. Of course, I had 
some preparations before I uh, went to the Gemini, but that that was just the starting point. There were some knowns and there were so many unknown factors. And uh, yeah, we sourced this wood and um, we decided that we will sandblast it so that uh, the character of the wood really stands out and the, uh, and the grains that I want to show um, shows in the best uh, possible manner. And uh, then you know, Jill took me over to this uh, uh, sandblasting place, uh, which is really not for, you know, it's, it's not a place where artists go or they do the art, artist stuff. They are the people who do for, you know, they provide service to NASA. So, you know, we were these two people who were, Jill drove me an hour away from LA and we carried these four or five planks of wood and, you know, uh, they uh, graciously uh, did what we uh, needed for the print and we brought it back and exposed all the grains and, you know, uh, cut it and created the pattern and laid it out. And, um, you know, I really wanted to um, challenge myself and push the limits a little bit further and make the print um, a sculpture, a print and a sculpture at the same time. So uh, it became possible that. Right. Uh, you worked with Jeff McMain, who's my colleague behind the lens this morning, uh, in, in finding a, a fluorescent back for your print knowing that you were going to have a dimensional piece and that this color would be reflecting onto the paper behind the print. Here's I a... I can see the color reflecting on your hand, Jill, already there. <laughs> yes. Well, oh, here's, here's the finished piece. And I think that, you know, you can see the halo. Right. <laughs> You guys have done a great job. You know, I'm, I'm so happy with the way it is looking. Well, there, I think the most hands were on this press. I mean, on this print. Uh, the edition was printed by um, Isabel Boussain and Oliver Dewey Gardner. And uh, the curating team, James Harrison and Amara Sands were, were very involved with the finishing touches on this piece. Um, So yeah, you want to say anything about the colors and um, you know how we went about? Uh, sure. I mean, colors. it looked mm -hmm. like you you know you had a color palette that that right. you had in mind. And one thing with uh, printers, uh, a tool that's very helpful is a, a Pantone book, which allows an artist to to page through and find exactly the color they want. Um, so Ranjini did find her colors mixed. Uh, we mixed them to her for satisfaction. And each, each of these pieces is blended. You know, in this particular one, the, the roll was just, you know, one color here on the edge, another color here in the middle. But each piece has, you know, a subtle blend. And I think that, you know, you can kind of see the piece here and, and how colors, you know, we were just using a tiny bit of pink here down to transparent, you know, leaving a, a blank space there. So everything is um, multicolor. Each block has a little bit of uh, more than one color, two colors, sometimes three. Uh, this piece is titled Ali Ali. And what does that translate to? Um, in my native language, um, Ali means uh, wave. So it's like wave, wave. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I wanted to bring a happy, feeling in the print and I was taking reference of um, uh, nature um, for the imagery um, and as well as uh, the material that I was using um, could together uh, work to form that imagery. Well, thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Now, I think maybe we'll we'll move around the table here. And look at a few more pieces in more in depth. Max introduced the pieces, but I did want to talk a little bit about process. This piece, Sinetching by Jasper Jones, titled Artist at Work. And Max did mention these little 
brooms that that are maybe brooms, but they, they might actually be brushes. This is a, a three plate etching. And the first plate you see is this background. It goes from a blue gray to a green gray. And a process called a la poupée was used where one color is inked in the bottom part, another color is inked in the top. And it, it can get very, um, you know, very, you have to be very delicate when you're mixing your colors because here we have sort of a straight edge and, and the colors come right up to each other. So it's, it's not an easy thing to do. The second plate that was printed was an aqua tint and that carries the three colors that you see. And uh, again, the ala poupée process was used where the yellow is inked there, the red there and the blue there. And the last process, the last plate is a black plate. And uh, I, I kind of admire how, how Jasper was able to use three different techniques in, in making this black plate. This sort of beautiful thick painted line is, is made from a sugar lift aqua tint. And the hand outline of the hand is a soft ground. And then the figures are open bit. And, and when that happens, the ink, you know, it is a deep white and the ink just sort of clings to the edge and gives a nice soft sort of, uh, sort of a look. Uh, Jasper, you know, was, did, was not able to come to, to Gemini. So this was one print that was done by mail. John Lund, his printer in uh, New York, developed the plates with him and sent them to uh, Case Hudson and Case, you know, reproof this and, and, and really, I think, coaxed out a, a really beautiful print out of these plates. So Case Hudson editioned this with assistance by Oliver Dewey Gardner. I think we'll pan down now to the uh, Richard Serra. Richard Serra composite for the Met. So Richard, you know, this, this image came from one of his drawings, you know, and he, uh, he, used, he finds walls and he finds asphalt on streets and he will take a tracing and he will begin with that sort of texture as uh, a starting point. There are um, two layers to this. You see kind of a, a, a lighter black here with a gray. That was done with the aqua tint etching. And there is no white of the paper because after the aqua tint was made, a very transparent black was rolled on top of the etching plate. That was printed once that was dry. Um, the etching ink and oil paint stick process was used to make this top really rich, really dense black layer. I'm gonna pull this up a little bit. I don't know if Jeff can get a, allow you to see a little bit of the texture. And uh, you know, that's kind of a laborious process and this, this material is, is pushed through a screen and um, lifted and, and presents this beautiful sort of texture. This, Edition was printed by Xavier Fumat with assistance from Garrett Mertz. All right, let's let's uh, pan over to Julie Maritou. Julie uh, had, was in town and she was uh, working on a very large uh, project with the etching team, and uh, you know was very happy to to be a part of the portfolio on this project. And this is titled Arms, and it's a dry point and engraving and uh, with a very delicate chincole. I think that you can see a difference between the, the background paper and the paper. A little bit of a sheen there, it's very nice. This was edition by Case Hudson. Right, if we pan up a little bit, uh, you know, this is a, a lithograph and serograph you know, and some handwork um, by Getchi Mutu titled Girl. Uh, and this is, you know, where SARS COVID came into play a little bit. Uh, you know, when Getchi was in New York, she wanted to come to LA. She wasn't able to come to LA, went back to Kenya. And then the travel ban was put in place and, and she was, you know, this, so this went quite a, quite a distance. Uh, so she's, what we received from Wangetchi was a, a wash painting on mylar. And uh, that was scanned and translated to a, a nice, beautiful sort of dot screen. And, and that is the brown that you see, the lithographic brown. The uh, second run was the black on the lips. Then a gloss was printed on top of that black. The fourth press run was a silkscreen run yellow on the nails, or excuse me, it was a clear on the nails. 
and then a very fine gold powder that she um, requested was dusted on top of that, you know, duly printed ink, brushed away. And there you have it. This was uh, printed by Andy Joe Tuse and Isaac Osher. All right, we're gonna cruise around the room a little bit. Uh, this piece by Carrie James Marshall, I think you saw a little bit of it. Uh, we had literally eight hours with Carrie in the studio and uh, he arrived with a backpack and a big plastic bag. <clears throat> Out of the bag, he pulled um, a fully carved wood block, fully carved linoleum block, a, a registration backer and an, an inking platform. So I think you can see like these little registration pens. So Carrie had it all set up for us where basically, you know, we could snap into places. These uh, pieces, put the middle in and, you know, after they were inked and run it through the press. You know, and he also brought this great little sort of jig that we could place on top of his pieces and, you know, run across it with the roller, which was actually very helpful. Great. This is an image um, that's made from silk screen and woodblock and linoleum. On the left, you see uh, are the silk screen components. You know, we were working with Carrie and he wanted to try it on a gray paper as well as sort of a warm white and we couldn't actually find the right gray paper. So uh, Jeff McMain working in silk screen, you know, found the right gray, uh, you know, quickly shot the components, ran the four colors, you know, then it came to, to the Litho studio and these components were dropped. And, you know, by the end of the day, we actually, we had the RTP. So it was fast. I think we're gonna, um, the next thing uh, on the wall is the uh, Ed Roche. So Ed, you know, being another pro, he's in town. So he came in with Buster, his dog, and, uh, uh, this little sheet of paper. He liked this color, you know, paper, and he wanted this color red. You know, so that's where we started. He also had two two artworks, you know, one of brush strokes and one of the the words in town. So you know, from there we were able to scan the artwork, make plates, shoot plates, and you see the the plate components below. So you have an idea of how it was printed and sequenced. Uh, the red he wanted really rich, so the red was plate was printed twice a transparent black and uh, black and then the text Boomtown. You know, while Ed was here, he said, what are you working on? You know, so we pulled out a couple pieces of, uh, you know, a couple artworks that we were in progress with. And, and one of them was, uh, had a little bit of embossing. And I saw him look at it and he, he actually sort of studied it for a minute. So we were, um, we, you know, we did, he requested and proved what he wanted. And then we also um, threw in a little <coughs> twist at the end, <coughs> excuse me, a twist at the end where we embossed. Uh, you can see the embossing plate we used, the polymer plate, but we embossed the, the text Boomtown. And uh, so when he walked in, he, he looked and he went down the row and he looked and he came to the last one, which was embossed and, and turned around and said, uh, wow, you threw me a curveball. And he was very happy with this. Uh, the next project we're going to look at is uh, 11 Color Silk Screen by Sarah Z. And Sarah works, you know, Jeff McMain, my uh, colleague behind the, the lens, is actually the person who editioned this, so he might chime in with a few things. But this is, uh, <laughs> he's shaking his head now. So this piece is uh, actually 11 runs of silk screen. And Sarah works, you know, very large. And the way she came to this image was to have a painting in progress, take a photograph of it, have a digital printout, tear up that digital printout, paste it onto the painting or tape it onto the painting with fluorescent tape, take another photograph, you know, another print, tear that up and, and build this thing in layers. So this came to us with uh, just, through email and Jeff, you know, was able to, to sort of pull it apart color by color and, and make, 
make silk screens for this. There's a one of the screens is up now, and you can see sort of if you're getting close, you can see the detail of them. You know, Sarah has taught printmaking, and I think one of the things that uh, she talked a little bit about was seeing all these rejects, you know, in the garbage, things that people threw out, and uh, and this sort of gave her this idea of sort of I don't know how you're talking about it, but of sort of what happens when you when you fold something, you know, and uh, and it, you know something might leave a leave a a trace of what was what was the original. She also was interested in embossing. I don't know if you can see it, but there are some of the areas that are embossed on this print. This is titled Papillon, and it was printed by Jeff McMain and Richard Cass. This is Xu uh, Bing's piece titled Art for the People for the Met. And uh, she was really interested in getting sort of a print that looked somewhat authentic, you know. Uh, so he didn't want to print on a Japan paper or a Chinese paper, but he wanted to have that sort of texture represented, you know, so that that's what you see there. Um, this, this was interesting because I think, you know, sometimes uh, you communicate with somebody <clears throat> through email or phone calls or even a, a third person and and maybe you don't actually ha you know have all the information that you, you think you're gonna you're, get when they walk in the door so Bing came and he had this beautiful painting you know and said okay let's make the print and we said well do you have the files and he said what files so at that point you know we, we got in touch with Juan his assistant in New York and and uh I, we really uh, Stacy Smith and Salita Montoya worked really, really fast and really hard with those files to develop this image. Uh, you can see here, like this is a, what was really important to me, as I mentioned, was this look of authenticity. And when an ink wash is, is painted on paper, there's a little bit of a bleed. So there's <clears throat> this sort of color, this shadow color, which sits underneath the black calligraphy you know you know you really have to sort of I don't know if you can see it you can kind of see it on the on the undersides of some of these you know and then yes these these very clever QR codes you know originally we we silk screened them on and then he thought <clears throat> that he would rather have them be printed and released and be different colors so there are slightly different reds and they were printed from these uh, polymer plates And they do take you to a, a nice surprise when you travel to your bed. <clears throat> the last print I'm going to talk about is by Sia Armajani. And this was another print that was done by mail entirely. Um, we talked to Sia on the phone. He had an idea of what he wanted to do. And um, he sent us a, a color marker drawing on my life. It was quite a beautiful. You know, at that point, um, you know, we did some tests with marker on vellum that we sent to him and he chose the, the size pen he wanted to work with. We also made a little map. We broke down sort of the colors of, of how he would create his drawings, what colors would go where, that sort of thing. Sent back Mylar's and a registration uh, system for him. And uh, you can sort of pan across the colors and see how these are the individual plates. I think this is, this is what Sia's first uh, lithograph actually. And then, As Max mentioned, it's titled House Above Bridge. This was editioned by Celia Montoya, Stacy Smith, and Sarah Alice Palmer. So I think that sort of um, concludes 
are part of the, the program. And, um, you know, I think if there are any questions, hopefully they can be fielded to any technical questions, they can be fielded to us and we can get back to people. But thank you very much and thank you, Jeff. Thank you very much. I have to say, as someone involved in Old Master and, and classic prints, that was extremely uh, informative and I thought riveting and exciting. Thank you to all our brilliant speakers today with special gratitude to the Metropolitan Museum, um, to Gemini, to Max Holine, Jennifer Farrell, uh, Sydney Felsen, Joni Weil, and the staff of the IFPDA for getting this together. Uh, print month will continue for a couple of more weeks for a change of pace. Tune in Monday at noon for the first in a series of three presentations on the Prince of the Grosvenor School of Modern Art, which began in 1925, and uh, focus of which has been color of line of cuts. The images, I think, will sweep you away. For those of you who gravitate to studio visits with artists, next Friday it will be Kiki Smith at Harlan and Weaver. Thank you very much for attending. Bye, everybody. <laughs>